Price Radio. It's very nice to have you with us here today. We are coming to you from Sweden in Scandinavia. And as you know, our website is redicecreations.com, R-E-D-I-C-E, creations.com. And today we are going to talk about Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, and we are going to, I guess in a sense, uh, shatter the consensus image that I think most people have about Mozart, uh, which some have even dubbed the uh, Freemasonic uh, composer. We have Robert Newman with us here on the line today, who uh, will be releasing a book on this subject uh, uh, somewhere at the end of uh, the summer, probably. And uh, Robert has been studying this uh, for uh, quite some time, and uh, we're going to get into this uh, other side of uh, Mozart. We're going to uh, see how this image, as it were, of him has been um, created, uh, this pivotal composer and uh, a genius image, so to speak, that we have uh, of, of Mozart at this point. So this is going to be really, really interesting uh, program. So uh, I hope you uh, keep your eyes pierced, as it were, here. Uh, welcome to the program, Robert. Thank you very much for coming on Red Eyes Radio. Well, thank you very much, Henrik. It's a pleasure to be with you and to share uh, these insights and these discoveries with your good self and with your listeners. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, Robert. Uh, how long have you been studying this particular subject? And also, tell us how you first uh, got into this and interest, and, and how did your interest in uh, Mozart first began? Well, uh, I'm originally from Scotland, and uh, as a youth, and later, especially during my studies in London, uh, when I studied music, I was as enamored with Mozart as almost any person could be. I, I wouldn't say fanatical, but I, I, I was blown away by the sheer beauty and uh, uh, the, the depth and the, uh, the wonder of his music to the point where I wanted, to, I suppose, if you love something, you, you want to understand it more, or at least you want to bring yourself closer to it. So I began examining, reading the standard biographies, of which there are many, of course, and building up over years and I'm now in my early 50s, uh, a, a, a knowledge of Mozart and an understanding of Mozart, an appreciation of Mozart. He tends to be, uh, he, he's a kind of person who can uh, draw you in. You know, the, the sheer volume, the sheer, uh, the scale of the correspondence, the, de the, 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 sh the number of his pieces, the dramatic nature of his life, etc., all of these tend to be something of a secular religion, in fact, hmm. and it's studied internationally. Uh, you have huge conferences de debating, discussing almost every aspect of his life and career. And so over a period, uh, I looked perhaps more closely than other people, but it gradually emerged that there were made serious inconsistencies with what one is reading and what may actually be the, the fact of the matter. And not least in the suppression of a great number of composers whose names are hardly known today, who lived at the same time and interacted with him, etc. And then it became obvious that, uh, and that's undisputable, indisputable, is the number of works which have been falsely attributed to Mozart since his death in 1791, mm -hmm. running into hundreds and hundreds of symphonies, concertos, masses, even operas uh, which are attributed to Mozart but later deleted from successive versions of the Kirchhoff catalogue. So I was approaching it from that aspect that how can such a huge, a colossal uh, group of misattributions feature in the life and career of this person? And this fascinated me and I was determined to start making notes, which I did 15 years ago, but with no idea really of what I would uncover, and only in the last five years or so have I really started to uncover major, major discrepancies and, and facts which uh, I can only describe as being suppressed by the mainstream Mozart industry, which incidentally, as you may know, is a multi-million dollar industry yeah. and spin-offs spin -offs into recording industry, the tourist industry, the chocolate industry, and everything else. <laughs> so... So uh, you, 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 you start to question the consensus, but you don't leave it there. And uh, I came to a point where I thought, yes, this is now capable of being expressed coherently in the form of a, a critical book against Mozart and his myth. What, what so, were some of the things that first got your eyes open to this? What, what were, do you remember some of the discrepancies that you stumbled upon, so to speak, when you were researching Mozart? 
I think uh, the biggest thing is the suppression of evidence. Uh, the, the suppression of information can sometimes be as damaging as propaganda itself. And that was one aspect. There are manuscripts today uh, in various libraries and museums, archives, which have the name of Mozart written on them, although we know for certain that they're actually written by other composers. Uh, and this scandal continues even to this day. In you, Modine, sorry. Yep. You know, uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask, do you have any, any uh, example of some of these uh, uh, the compositions that, that aren't um, Mozart's? I, I would go as far as to say, and here's the first shock of the of our conversation, that Mozart, the real Mozart, wrote probably half a dozen works in his entire life. Okay. <laughs> half a dozen. Uh, mm. The rest, if that, if that. Uh, Mozart was a, a musician of no great talent. He was a provincial musician. Um, a, 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 a provincial musician being propelled uh, falsified on a scale that is almost uh, is difficult for us to believe. It's difficult for us to understand that the works of William or the plays of William Shakespeare may not have been written by William Shakespeare, but people have been saying this for 300 and 400 years. Yes. And, uh, and we really must at some point start to say what is the alternative? And mm. uh, it's this alternative that I'm, I'd like to, to put forward and sustained by, uh, if necessary, uh, with the source documents that can support this view. Yes. Well, l let's uh, talk a little bit about some of the, the sources. You you mentioned here to me before that you, uh, and, and there's also uh, other people around the world who have uh, been, been following uh, this story and have been researching this as well. Isn't that right? That's correct, yes. Uh, last year, for example, 2008, was publication of a book on the marriage of Figaro. You know, the marriage of Figaro is about as big as it gets in Mozart's musical reputation. An opera that was premiered in Vienna in on the 1st of May, 1786, a world famous opera. Surely, surely this has to be by Mozart, but it isn't. It isn't by Mozart. And nor is John Giovanni, nor is Cosi Fantuti, and nor is uh, the the, uh, the magic flute, the Zelba flute. Hmm. This is this is extraordinary, and each of these things would require some time. But uh, uh, of the 41 symphonies attributed to Mozart, of the 41, uh, hardly one of them is by Mozart. Uh, uh, of the, hmm? the, 20, the 27 piano concertos today attributed to Mozart. We know already, uh, and this is already recognized, that the first seven of them are actually arrangements by other composers. They're not by Mozart at all. Hmm. Uh, so the, exp the explanation for this, again, I'm happy to provide. Yes, uh, absolutely. Let's definitely get into here a little bit later. And what, what are some of the, uh, the sources then that, that you've been looking into? And, and are you saying also that these are sources that are kind of widely available for people to, to look into themselves, but this hasn't just been brought to, to attention or brought to light? Is, is that what you're saying? Correct. Uh, if you take, for example, the symphonies, the symphonies, uh, there's, a, there's a biography by a man named Maynard Solomon. It's a, it's a famous biography of Mozart. On the page uh, 503, uh, footnote 20, he, he goes on to say that not a single one of Mozart's first 25 symphonies show any evidence of being attributable to Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. I mean, when you start getting into Mozart by the kilo, then, then you start to realize that the childhood of Mozart was hugely exaggerated and falsified. But you must remember that these events were not taking place in public. They were taking place across Europe, a Europe which was already predisposed to Mozart because of the Holy Roman Empire. And that's exactly the context within which these things took place. Mm -hmm. the, Rosic the Rosicrucians and, the, and the, uh, uh, the Freemasons and later the Illuminati. Mm. All, of these, all of these secret organizations, these fraternities, supported the Mozart myth. 
for their own reasons, uh, and this is able to be documented, and we're able to show this very clearly. The, ex the scale of exaggeration involved, plus, of course, the suppression of the career of Nan Errol Mozart, who was his sister. Yes. She, she was five years older than him. She was a formidable, a formidable pianist, uh, but nobody mentions her, of course. Mozart himself was no genius. He was no genius even as a pianist. In fact, his Vienna years as a pianist were entirely falsified. Uh, uh, you can have, in the years of his Vienna career, 1783, 1784, he was in Vienna for two years at this point, and according to his correspondence, he was in huge demand as a soloist. Over Lent period, he, in 1784, he staged three concertos with 176 uh, patrons buying tickets and so forth. But the closer you study this, the more you realize it's actually untrue. This is being stage managed. And the historians of the time, take, uh, for example, Heinrich Koch. Heinrich Koch, C-O-C-H, was the musicologist living in Vienna at that time. He wrote a book on piano co that involved the deal with piano concertos after, uh, in 1793. He never once mentions Mozart. Nowhere. Mm -hmm. Nowhere does he talk about him whatsoever. Mozart was completely unknown, except for the elites. The elites who sponsored and patronized him, of course, many of them being members of the same fraternities. This is not a public composer. This is a private composer unknown to the world, and whose image was largely constructed after his untimely death in December of 1791. In fact, in, the, uh, his, in his lifetime, only three symphonies of Mozart, inverted commas, were actually published, three of the 41. Mm -hmm. and, of the, and of the 27 piano concertos of inverted commas Mozart, only five of these were published in his lifetime, and none of them are by Mozart. Hmm. So uh, I, I really, you, you, when we talk about exaggeration, there, there's, there's surely a limit between exaggeration and wholesale deception. I think we're talking about the latter. <laughs> so let, let's go back and talk a little bit about some of the, you know, Mozart's childhood, as it were, his, his upbringing, because again, many people have this idea that he's a uh, almost like a savant you know a, a genius he's like five years old and just he's an expert at the piano yeah. from the from the get-go and where, where does this story come from so to speak do you know that yes uh, it comes from the prevailing philosophy of the elites at that time which was of course uh, Voltaire and Rousseau you know these two French everything had to be French at this time the influence of French Philosophy was considerable before the French Revolution. You can see this reflected in the operas that were staged in Vienna at that time. Rousseau and Voltaire, believe it or not, they had bus. There were busts to Voltaire. There was a bust to Rousseau in the office of the Prince Archbishop of Salzburg, mm -hmm. Colorado. They were devoted supporters of. Russo 